And welcome back to the Financially Simple Experience. Friends, I got to tell you, I am super, super stoked, super excited to have yet another dynamic author. This individual, I got to tell you, man, he has changed my life. I have referenced countless uh, comments, countless paragraphs, statements from his books that he's written. And if you've not read his books, I'm going to tell you that you got to pick it up. We will have um, the we will have some links to his four books inside the show notes. But more importantly, I want to pick some wisdom. So joining me today is Mr. Les McCowan. How are you, brother? Uh, great to be here, Justin. Hey, everybody. <laughs> so let's let's start off with a little bit about your history before we get into <laughs> predictable success. The first book that I think uh, entered your world back in 2009. Let's talk a little bit about what where did you come from? What led you to write your very first book to predictable success? And then we'll dive into the journey that you've been on now for 20 plus years in the book authorship program. Sure. Well, the first um, tale, if you will, uh, that our listeners will gather in about two to three seconds from now is that from my accent, you can tell I'm not from these parts. Uh, although I'm staring out over the Chesapeake and I'm a U.S. citizen, I've been here 22 years, I've got my U.S. passport. Um, I was originally born in Northern Ireland in Belfast, and uh, I grew up there, and I was originally what here would be a CPA. I was a chartered accountant, the British equivalent of a CPA. Um, and <clears throat> I had no interest in doing anybody's taxes, uh, producing their books and records. It just a great mentor uh, when I was a kid realized he had this strange kid in his hands, it was me, because I was fascinating with, uh, with business. I mean, here I'm in my teens, I'm supposed to want to be, you know, I don't know what, an astronaut, a surfer, a, firefighter or anything but I was fascinated about my business and this guy Jim Johnson said uh, if you're really interested in business then you want to go qualify as an attorney uh, or as a CPA because both of those will give you a good basic understanding right. I did that and pretty soon this goes a long way back I you know I'm about 184 years of age as, as <laughs> that's not here. true <laughs> uh, this was in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, and there was a massive push on entrepreneurship in the UK, huge. The government was just pushing out incentives, cheap loans, everything, tax breaks, to get local people to launch local businesses. And the reason was that at that point, the UK was essentially a branch economy of South Korea, of all places, and here, the United States. So if Daewoo or LG or Ford uh, got a cold, we would lose 15,000 jobs in Leeds right. or Liverpool or somewhere like that. And so the UK government was really intent on uh, getting new businesses launched. And I became the go-to guy uh, for various reasons in Northern Ireland for people to come to, to get your business plan put together, maybe help you find an idea. If you didn't have one, partner you up with somebody. And before I knew it, people were actually beginning to ask me if I would join them on the journey, you know, would I become an interim CEO or just become one of the founding partners? And long story short, Justin, I got to cherry pick for about eight years, six, seven opportunities every year. And before I was 35, I had helped launch 42 organizations, most of them commercial businesses, a couple of not-for-profits, one was a hospital, for example. And... Um, you know what, even a dumb Irishman, if you do something that often, you begin to see recurring patterns. And that's what happened. I began to see these repeating patterns. I started to codify them. I was writing like crazy. And back then there was a thing called a lab book. And a lab book is like an iPad mini, but it's only paper, it's like a really thin moleskin. And I used to fill these with what I thought were these recurring patterns. And I, and I discovered that they held up. And not only that, they were interlinked. Um, middle of my career then, told you 185 years ago, uh, <laughs> I spent 10 years with, working with alongside another serial entrepreneur, actually was a good friend of mine, it was totally coincidental, we started working together, his name is Will McKee, and Will and I launched, well, we didn't have this phrase back then, but it was essentially one of the first incubation units in the world, uh, they were called for some reason science parks back then, I don't know why, but we launched one of these in Belfast in the middle of a civil war, uh, taking people off who, who were employed elsewhere. We'd bring them in two nights a week. We'd teach them all the fundamentals of launching a business. Then we'd do a shark tank type thing at the end, bring in some bankers and funders. 
And within one year of doing that, it just exploded. Economic development agencies from all over the world came to see our program and asked us if we would go launch those around the world. 10 years later, I got a company along with my partner, 110 or so people, 13 offices worldwide. Uh, you know, and we're at this point, not just helping launch new businesses, which would be hundreds and hundreds of those. We were helping existing businesses. So an economic development agency in middle Europe would call us in. They wanted, you know, to grow their own industry. So they would ask us to go into existing businesses and help them accelerate to second, third stage growth. So I'm seeing these patterns play out further. Final phase of the, of the whole story, you did ask. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm liking got, this. I've got this uh, model, uh, th th this um, series of interlinked observations, these patterns of growth. I think I, I, I know how this plays out. I have not at this point worked with really large global organizations, but I think I see how this, these patterns play out. And I had a magnificent opportunity, it was 22 years ago, to move out to the West Coast uh, here in the US. I moved to the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And through some a great, just one guy who had fantastic uh, ins, I got to work with Microsoft, US Army, American Express, T-Mobile, just, you know, Sun Microsystems, Harvard University. Um, just to see if the, if the patterns I believed played out in very large mega organizations, the way my model said they should. And it did, That's, it was the model proved out from cradle to grave. And that's the model I call predictable success. And we'll talk a little bit, break the model down shortly. But I had the, the, the model, the moving parts really put together about 2001, 2002. And you asked me how the book came to be, to, to be written. Very simple, my uh, darling then and now ex-wife, um, uh, told me that in 2007, I either had to stop talking about writing a book or write it or shut up. And <laughs> I did what she told me. And I love it. And so that's came. where predictable success came from the book, predictable Correct. success. So friends, I've mentioned this particular book many, many, many times. Les, I got to tell you, um, this book has changed my business, not just the clients that we have the honor and privilege to serve daily, but I think the, the path, you understand the rainbow with all your little squiggly lines inside the book, the path is, is powerful, not just as you said, I think you said cradle to grave. It's not just for the small business owner, the solopreneur, it works in big business. So let's break down that umbrella path, if you will, where it begins with early struggle and ultimately concludes with death rattle. And just, just a little bit of each of those points sure. that we've looked at. Sure. Well, uh, just everybody hang on, uh, folks, because I want to take you in a, a real rocket ship tour of something that is my life's work. But essentially, as you mentioned, Justin, we've got seven stages. We've got three growth stages. We've got the apex, which no surprise, <clears throat> excuse me, is the one the stage called predictable success and then three decline stages. And every organization doesn't. When I wrote the book originally, I was only writing in the context of for profit business at that point. But I realized as I was finishing the book and in my real world experience, that all of this applies to any group of two or more people trying to achieve common goals. And these days, for example, about 40% of all of the work I do are with uh, not-for-profits for, for faith-based organizations, cause-based organizations, NGOs, government uh, bodies, because it applies to any group. But let, let me take us through it from the context of, of business, use business terminology. So first stage, early struggle. Anybody, any of our listeners who have launched their own business, you know what that's like. It's an early struggle. It's, it's a struggle to find a profitable, sustainable market. A lot of people don't recognize that. That's one of the reasons that they get stuck in there and die ultimately. There is a massive mortality rate. 80% of all new ventures fail within three years. And that's in normal economic times. In both boom and bust, for reasons we don't have time to discuss, that number spikes. We'll see a huge number of uh, early struggle defaults in the next number of years for economic reasons. But if you're one of the one in five in a good year that gets through early struggle and we'll come back and my second book really talks about what it is that's happening underneath the head, the, the, the lid, so to speak, that gets us through these stages. You get through early struggle, you found a profitable, sustainable market. You hit the first growth stage and it's the, what, of all seven stages is the one I've given the most technical name to. I call it fun because that's what it is, it's fun. 
And the reality is that for those of us, me, first time, maybe even second, third time that I was involved in launching a business and um, most everybody else who launches a business, they think that's it. So they know we're going to have a tough time to get started. And then they hit fun and they think, done it, I'm here. We've made it. This is it. It's only the second of seven stages. That's, that's a big, big, big realization right there. Fun is that. It's just fun. We say yes to everything. And we, we, we just make it up on the hoof. Right? We improvise everything. We, um, we work like crazy. We're righteously exhausted every Friday evening. We're having beer busts because there's no HR department yet to tell us not to. And because we <laughs> somehow, somehow got that product to that customer, you know, 3000 miles away. And not only that, it just looked fantastic and we did a great job. So it's exhausting, but it really feels good. And we grow like crazy because our customers and clients love the flexibility that we bring. And that growth brings with it one thing's happening every single day, just quietly behind the scenes without us really most of the time even noticing it. And that is we're just getting a little tiny bit more complex each day. New product lines, new service offering, another staff member, maybe we open another location, our geographic um, footprint gets bigger. And that complexity at some point eventually throws us into the third growth stage, which is a stage I call whitewater, because that's what it feels like. There we were sailing down the river, saying yes to everything, somehow making it happen. And then suddenly everything's shaking, everything's rattling and stuff's beginning to fall overboard. We're starting to make mistakes. We're standing on our own feet. You know, we sign a, a lease with a stupid clause in it that gets us stuck with something for five years that we didn't want to fail to turn up for an important customer client meeting. You know, we, we send product out and, and we realize it's a complete wrong customer we sent out to. Whatever it is, we, we're just beginning to screw up. Now, what's happened? Have we all suddenly got stupid? Things like that. But the answer is actually just complexity has overwhelmed our ability to say yes to everything and then just improvise it. It's just a growth stage. We've got to start for the first time we begin to use phrases like the one I'm about to use. We've got to bring in enterprise-wide systems and processes. We've got to codify what we do, make it rinse and repeatable so that we can get through to the next stage in growth. If that's what we want, maybe later uh, in the call, we'll talk about whether you need to, do, you have to do this or not. But if you want to push through to this next stage, which I call predictable success, you really got to put some systems and processes in place. Now, what's happening at that point is that the founder or founder group is going through an existential crisis. First of all, because they think the business is dying. They don't think this is just a natural state. You know, remember fun was what it was meant to be like. So this must be what it's like when we die. And it, 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 there's a whole bunch of challenges in here, which we'll maybe talk about. And I talk about them mostly in the second book, The Synergist. But if the uh, founder founder group decide they want to get through to predictable success, we've got to put these systemic systems and processes in. And that allows us to get to predictable success. It's very painful. Whitewater is a horrendously painful stage to go through. A lot of conflict in leadership teams at that point. So why would you do it? What, 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 what's predictable success got that fun doesn't? The ability to scale. That's it. That's the only reason you would put up with this pain. And when I talk about scale, in, in fun, we grow. And think about that as an arc, like you lob a ball into the air. Growth in fun is like the, that arc. It goes up, but it's always leveling out. The ability to put in double, triple digit growth begins eventually to wane. And then we're just polishing the apple towards the end. In predictable success, we can get a J curve. Right. So think of, you know, rocketing up the, the part of the dodgems where you're being pulled up to the very top. We can scale in predictable success. That's why you would push through there. You do all the right things. You can stay in predictable success indefinitely. This is the one area where this life cycle that I'm describing is different from the natural life cycle. As I am abundant <laughs> example of we can't stop the natural aging process. But if you do the right things, you can cycle in predictable success for as long as you keep doing those right things. GE was in predictable success by my reckoning about 17 years or so, mostly under Jack Welsh. I have a client still back in the UK, graphic design company, been in predictable success for over 30 years because they just keep doing the right things. But the majority of us, what happens is we got into predictable success, it's fantastic. What got us here? 
systems and processes. What do we do with something that delivered something good? My approach to the dessert tray, have some more. So we begin to over depend on systems and processes, fall into the first of the decline stages. I call it treadmill. And treadmill is just the mirror opposite of Whitewater. Whitewater, for the first time, we were the under-processed organization. Now in treadmill, for the first time, we are systemically over-processed. You know, we begin to talk a lot about compliance. It's all about checklists and so forth. It's more important that we use the precise Pantone color in our brochures than that our brochures are fantastic. Customers have to fill in 11 fields in a form online just to get a call back. And that's a sort of a natural thing happens with most organizations. If you do the right thing, which is just lift your foot off the systems and processes a bit, breathe a bit more, come back a little bit, you're back in predictable success. But if you don't make that adjustment, ultimately you fall into the penultimate stage, last but one called the big rut. And the big rut is exactly the same as treadmill, except now we like it like this. We've lost the power to self diagnose. We're stuck in a long, slow decline into irrelevance. I'm looking at you, Harvard, and you, Microsoft, debatable, I'm sure, but happy to talk about it. But they're, in my world, two classic examples of organizations that are in the big rut. Both of them have got, I mean, Harvard's got $33 billion in near cash. It's so not going anywhere soon. Same with Microsoft, massive war chest, not going anywhere soon, but long, slow slide into irrelevance and decline. And then ultimate, <clears throat> at the very end, there's a brief uh, phase, I call it death rattle because it's a little bit like that. You see a little momentum. Happened funny enough with uh, Kodak, so, uh, some of our older listeners will remember Kodak, that used to be the king of uh, film in the days when that was how you took pictures. Uh, but in fact, all that's happening is that this dead organization is being put to bed. So those are our seven stages. So let's go back to a statement that you made, because I think it's apropos for so many business owners. And that is we're in this fun stage. We, we have a business, maybe we have a dozen employees or a hundred employees, but we've reached, we've got our product to the market. People want our goods or services. And now we find ourselves suddenly in, in white water. And you ask the question, and I want to circle back around to see what your answer is. I think I know based on read, all your readings and your podcasts and everything, but we're in white water. Should we, if we look at this predictable success model, should we strive for predictable success? Or should we say, you know what, forget this, let's scale down and go back to fun. Where would you guide the individual or business owner in that type of thinking? It's a, a, a great question, Justin. Um, and so, I mean, I'll give you, let me first of all, give you a real world example of this. And then uh, let me come back and give you where the answer comes from. The real world example, I used to live in a beautiful little, beautiful little Massachusetts village called Marblehead Sailing Village, just gorgeous. And um, a couple of friends of mine there opened a coffee shop that was a roaring success. Everybody loved it. They opened a second one a little further out of town. Really, really good. Opened a third one. Things start to go a little funky fourth one everything collapses in so they have a choice they can go back to fun which is probably two and a half except you can't open a half a coffee shop uh coffee shops or they decide oh, we're going to be like caribou coffee a regional uh scalable business or maybe even starbucks national global and both of those choices are completely valid. And at the end of the day, the answer is, well, what do you want? Do you want to scale? In which case you're gonna to have to learn things like bulk purchasing, how to hire and train unit managers. You're gonna to have to start using phrases like unit managers. Uh, you're gonna to have to up your marketing game because you won't be able to recruit just from people who know and love you. So all that sort of stuff. Do you wanna be doing all of that? Or do you wanna go back and you know run a couple of outlets and have fun? Now, this, the, the, the numbers can be very different. You can be, uh, two, I know, a two, 300, two to $300 million business, number of them that are in Whitewater. So I'm not saying it's all mom and pop versus real business. This can happen depending on your industry with very big numbers involved. But the, but the answer is, what do you, what do you want to operate? Now, to dig into that, we need to very quickly cover a whole part of the predictable success model that I didn't put in the first book, not for any smart reason, apart from the fact that I couldn't find a way 
to put the model all in one book that wasn't going to be so big that nobody would ever dream of reading it. So I split the model into two and it does cleanly separate, but it's all one model. It's like a Neil Young concert. It's all one song, right? So the predictable success model is actually predictable success, my first book and the synergist, which is my second book. So if, if I may, if it's okay with you, I want to take just Please. a real short period of time and, and bring in these ad additional important elements. And what the synergist is all about, it really the stuff, if the if the predictable success part is the mechanics, it's the like the railroad tracks. The synergist is all about the people that make this happen. And to understand how that decision in Whitewater uh, ends up being made, we need to follow the arc of the folks that are primarily involved. So right back at the outset, let's go right back, not, not just to the point where our, our new business is about to be born, just before them. There is always somebody, you know, classically sitting, if we're going to make a movie about this, they'd be sitting at 4 a.m., can't sleep, they'd have a yellow pad or their iPad or whatever, they'd be making notes. When the camera pans in, what are they doodling? It's the business plan for their own venture. Yep. Now, this is somebody I call the visionary. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they go up um, mountaintops and have, you know, strange mystical experiences. It means they have the vision to do this thing. You know, a great definition of an entrepreneur, somebody who stops working 40 hours a week for somebody else, to work 80 hours a week for themselves. And you'll know this, many of the listeners will know this, the number one compelling reason people start their own businesses is not for the money. That's like a chalkboard that marks, it's like the scoreboard in the tennis game. The reason they start their new business is for autonomy and freedom. They want the freedom to do things their way. And that's what impels them to take a risk with something that's got an 80% chance of failure. So here's our visionary. And if we don't, by the way, have a visionary in the launch group, that's guaranteeing we're going to be part of that 80%. We need the visionary because they've got the big, bright ideas. They're the ones that go the risk takers. Here's the thing. Every visionary worth their salt, whether they've ever heard my terminology or would call themselves that or not, they know that one of their weaknesses is detail drives them round the bend. Yes, they can do it if they have to, but what they really want to do is start thinking about the next big thing because visionaries are starters. They start stuff. So what they do intuitively is they link it up really early on with somebody that I call an operator. And an operator is the symbiotic twin for the visionary. Not, they're just ruthless finishers. That's all they do is they get stuff done, right? They might use a different word for that. <laughs> It'll not be pretty, right? They go right. through breeze block walls, right? They, you know, their, their, their grandmother is just an obstacle in the path. I got to, you know, I got to get this thing done. And the visionary with a growing group of operators that the visionary is conducting like an orchestra, that's the perfect setup and fun. And that's what most fun businesses are. Here's our visionary, and she's conducting a group of operators who are becoming big dogs in the organization, getting a lot of their own autonomy, a lot of their own freedom. And here's our operator, Andy. He's the salesperson out there selling like crazy. Here's our operator, Julianne, and she's the install queen. She just makes it happen. Here's another operator keeping everybody happy after the event, and a final one looking after the admin. Not an awful lot of need for those people to talk to each other. The, the visionary conducting that orchestra, and the, that's the business growth. Here's the big existential change that happens in Whitewater. At this point, two things emerge that are very challenging. One is, for the first time, we need a third style in the leadership group, a style that I call the processor. And that's just somebody who comes in with the skill set to bring process and systems to wherever we've been screwing up. It might be a warehouse manager, might be a, a chemist, might be quality controller, could be a, just a controller, just depends where we've been messing up. But what's happening is for the very first time, this third style, we've, we've, we've had some systems and processes and fun, precisely the amount needed to keep us out of jail, right? <laughs> so we've had some little mini P's, just not in leadership, just filing our accounts, filing our regulations. Now, for the first time, we've got a processor in the group, and this three does not make for a stable triangle. For the first time, we have people with different, completely different views of how things work. Visionary and operator, fast, 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 fast. Processor, ho, 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 ho. not so fast. Cut twice, 
I'm sorry, I measured twice, twice. Clip once. Visionary and operator, just do the right thing, do the right thing. Hint, that means whatever the customer wants. Right. Processor, no, I, don't, I don't really care what the thing is, we're doing it right. So from do the right thing to do the thing right. And those produce a clash. So that's the first thing that we've got this weird, strange group of people trying to get to, uh, on together. And the second thing that happens is much harder to see and is much more difficult to fix. And it's this leadership in the fun business. Stay with me here, folks. Doesn't, there's no such thing as a leadership team. Right. We might have a group that we call that. They might even get together. They might talk about some stuff. But the reality is we have the founder and we have a group of enablers. Everybody else, they're enablers. And I don't mean that in the negative drug pushing, alcohol pushing sense. I mean, they're just there in the best possible sense of the word to enable the visionary's vision. Tell me what to do next, boss. We'll go get it done. They're there to enable the growth of the vision. Now, I'm caricaturing this a little bit to make the position clear. What has to happen in Whitewater, if we're going to get into and stay in predictable success, is we the, the whole way in which we make decisions has got to change away from a unitary series of discussions, visionary. Like in, in fun, a, a board meeting is a ride up in the elevator, right? Get in. Visionaries there, two operators, punches the button for the 14th floor. By the time you've got off the 14th floor, we're opening an office in Chicago. Why? Because the visionary met a guy who loves it, going to do it. Now we've got to move towards high quality team based decision making. We've got to develop a leadership team, which may or may not be the same people who got us where we are now. They've got to learn, and yet nobody tells them or gives them a manual how to get together, how to make decisions, because all of the information necessary to overcome the complexity of whitewater is not in that elevator anymore. It's all over the place. And it's beyond the can of any one individual to just make dominant decisions about everything. So those two issues are the ones to loop all the way back that when I'm working with somebody, that's what to help them make the right decision. Do I want to go to predictable success or do I want to go back to fun? The answer, the very specific answer is, to what extent are you prepared to not just put up with, but completely embrace, join in, support those two things, the development and adherence to systems and processes, along with the processors that come in, and the development of high quality team-based decision-making. Whenever we look at that in the terms of implementing, moving through Whitewater, getting to predictable success, the synergist is the title of your second book. And in the book, you write about what the synergist characteristics are. I love the way you use storyline and narrative to explain the vital role of the synergist to bring unification to those three parts. Uh, in our podcast here recently, Les, we've had several uh, award-winning authors talk about various things from change to leadership but I think it's interesting inside your book, The Synergist here, chapter number 11, you deal with something. I don't expect you to memorize all this. I'm going to read you what, what you wrote, which we're dealing with pulling the trigger, evaluating and decision making. And inside here, the very first table you have has three words that begin with I, investigation, interpretation and implementation. I think it's interesting how you define those three words after we've identified the visionary, the operator, and the process to bring the synergist in play. Can we talk a little bit around the dissection of that investigation, interpretation, and implementation? I hope I'm not putting you on the spot too much. For that, no, not, for that. not at all. Um, I'd right. love to give just a quick bit of backstory and, Please. and um, explain where the synergist fits in what I, everything that I just said. So in everything that I've talked about so far, We've recognized the need for the visionary operator processor to, to we need all of those to get into predictable success. Right. And for the longest time, for uh, all of goes on 20 years, um, I worked with visionary operator processor groups. You know, you, you get to do this thing long enough. I can tell visionaries, operators, processors in a, in a heartbeat, you know, just open up your clamshell. Let me look at the at the uh, your home screen of your laptop or your computer. And, you know, I, I'm again, exaggerating for a little comedic effect. But <laughs> Pretty true. If you're a if you're a processor, there's going to be no loose documents and files kicking around there. There's going to be one folder, and everything's going to be in a rigid series of subfolders underneath that. You open up an operator's uh, laptop, and every document that anybody ever sent them is just yeah. it's like it was 
an explosion in a paper factory. And you know, thank goodness for search. The only way you can find anything on there. And uh, you, you try to run that deal with the visionary. Um, you have to come back tomorrow because the latest um, iMac Pro is being whistled its way over here for tomorrow. And then my seven-year-old nephew will set it up. <laughs> And by that time, there'll be an upgrade and I'll get the next. And so I can see all of these styles. And I'm so here I am and I'm working with leadership teams. I'm doing a really good job helping them see the need to not just sort of accept and put up with each other. And primarily that means the visionary operator putting up with the processor and vice versa, but actually embracing and supporting the, the need for all of those roles co-equally. And uh, it worked. Uh, for about three to six months, typically. And then either uh, I'd get a call uh, from my client or I'd <laughs> tell them enough to go visit them uh, six months later. And I said, Les, it worked perfectly well. Uh, and then it didn't. We just got back into our old way, scratching our own vision. So the visionary, you know, just typical, uh, couldn't help him, himself or herself. And, you know, visionaries invented hyperlinking. So, you know, the one thing a visionary is not going to talk about in any meeting is the agenda items for that meeting because yes. they got bored with that sucker the minute they saw it so there are three months of visionaries really working hard suppressing the instinct to you know target bomb every single meeting and then finally can't stand it any longer and just crops all over the agenda did it? uh processors been really really good at being succinct and getting to the point and then can't lose it you know lose it gotta gotta take you through a 60 page powerpoint like they'll die if they don't do that and operators just find ways to not be there you know, uh, this meet, these meetings, these Thursday meetings are great, boss, but our biggest customer is about to leave us. Do you want me to go fix that or come to the meeting? I don't mind. Which is it? So they just get exempted from that. And so, you know, I was changing that, but not permanently. And that was the key reason I wanted to come, if you remember, in that long uh, Genesis story. The key reason I wanted to come and work in the West Coast of the U.S. originally was I knew that there were teams of people who were in predictable success and who had stayed there for prolonged periods of time. And I wanted to see what was happening because I knew I was missing something and I was. And what happened was in watching those groups that had been in predictable success for some time, I'd be sitting there and I could say, and back then, thank goodness back then, everything was still physical. We weren't doing anything virtual because um, I would not have learned this, not I'm none against virtual meetings, but I just wouldn't have learned this if, I, if, if that hadn't happened. I would be sitting watching them and I'd say, there's, there's our vision, right? And two operators and six process. And then the, the group would start talking about something non-trivial, something important. And I'm looking around, who's, who's this? Because they were operating in a fourth style. The, the group was operating in a way that I hadn't recognized in my part. Uh, patterns up until now. And that's what I call the synergist style. And that's a key vital factor to remember about the synergist style. Of all of them, it's the only one that's a learned style. You can mimic uh, an ape, the visionary operator processor styles uh, to an extent, but mostly that's how we're structured. It's in our DNA. The synergist style, there are some natural synergists, but most synergists learn. And what is it? It's quite simply an understanding that if I'm in a group or team environment, I don't get to just have everything happen the way that scratches my visionary operator or processor itch. If I'm in a group or team environment and I'm a visionary, I will hijack the agenda as soon as we're getting to stuff that bores me or is in too much detail. If I'm a visionary synergist, I'll realize that's not good and we will not produce high quality decisions. And I can go through each of the styles and say the same, that the teams that stay in predictable success for prolonged periods of time, they've learned, they may never and, and the ones I observed, they certainly had never, because I hadn't written it yet. I never read my book, not knowing any of the, of the terminology, but they just inherently had learned this fourth synergist style, which is all about producing, remember from uh, our description of uh, one of the two things that we needed in Whitewater, high quality team-based decisions. That's what the synergist is there to do, is to keep our focus on what is right for the enterprise, not what is right for you as a visionary, so that you can scratch your visionary itch. What's right for you as a processor so that you can feel you've ticked all your boxes? That may not be what's right for the enterprise as a whole. So that's what that's the context within which the synergist is operating. And those three eyes that uh, you uh, uh, listed out, Jason, that's essentially the, the, the synergist's cockpit. That's where they have to switch on their synergist antennae 
and guide the group and help the group. Now, I'm talking in that case as if there's only one, and sometimes that's the case. There's a lone synergist trying to make this happen. But ideally, you want the whole, and the reason I wrote the synergist is, ideally, you want the whole team, the whole leadership team, to be able to move into it. Think of it as an extra gear in your car that when necessary, not all the time, but when necessary, we can all of us move into the synergist style. So as we move into the synergist style, that's what led to your book that you wrote in 2014 called Do Lead, which is a great book, friends. I want you to pick it up and read it. But I want to hone in on the most recent book, I believe, is Do Scale. I think that was the last book, if I'm not mistaken, Les, um, that we wrote. So I've actually read that book. I'm listening to it on Audible right now. I was driving back from Idaho. That's 40 hours, by the way, to drive across country from Idaho to Tennessee. Listen to a lot of books. I'm in the middle of Do Scale. And one of the things that we teach to the Financially Simple Experience is business owners can increase the value of their companies, the monetary value, using principles like we've been discussing here today. By, in, by focusing on the intangible assets of their business, it actually increases the, the multiple, which drives the value up even higher. In do scale, you define those scaling very interesting. I don't think I've heard anybody else talk about what scaling is is. I often hear, hey, we're going to scale the business. And I think, okay, what does that mean? Are we going to scale top line revenue? Are we Are going to scale, scale growth? But in the introduction to the book, I think it's chapter one, if I'm, if I'm memory surgeon right, you actually have the reader go through the exercise to define scale. And I know we're running out of time, Les, but I would love to hear that particular guidance. And I would love our, our business owners to listen to you guide them through this idea of hey, we may be in fun. We're going to find ourselves in whitewater eventually just with the nature of the business. Do we want to consider scale and move in predictable success or do we want to go to backwards? So can we spend a few minutes here, Les, talking about how you define scale and that exercise that you employ, uh, employ uh, the book reader the, as an author to walk the client through? What would that be? Well, um, the, the point you made is abs- absolutely, uh, the point you made a little earlier in the way through here is absolutely correct that if you put, five business people in a room and and, uh, start a discussion about scale, you'll end up with five conversations because everybody has, and that's one of the main reasons I I said right out front that I wrote the book is that the word has become sort of pretty meaningless. So I have a very specific meaning. I'm not saying it's the only meaning you can put into the word scale. You can, I mean, it's, it's a part of a fish's anatomy, right? So we could talk about scale in that context, but in the context that I'm talking about, Uh, Scaling is quite simply this. It's the ability to grow to whatever size your industry or the market you serve will allow. And I'll just break it down a little bit. It's the ability to grow. So scaling is a subset of growth. Uh, Growth is a wider thing. We'll talk about the difference between the growth, uh, the scalability and predictable success and growth and uh, fun in a moment or two. But in predictable success, the ability to scale means the ability to grow to whatever size your market that you serve or your industry will allow. So for example, the chewing gum industry has got a bigger market than the cell phone uh, cover industry. I don't say cell phones, that would be not right. <laughs> and I may even be wrong about that, but you reckon they both got different markets. So you, when, you, when you can scale, you can grow as large as the market will allow you. It doesn't mean you have to, it's not compulsory. You don't have to become the biggest in the world. But you can, you've got the mechanics to do that. That's what scalability is. Scaling is what happens as the result of scalability. Scalability makes it repeatable and makes it controllable. Some people, we've seen businesses in, in our lifetimes that have scaled despite themselves. I'm not talking about that either. There are some businesses just held onto a, a, a donkey's tail and got taken off, right? And if that happens to you, God bless you. I'm talking about being able to put this in a bottle to make it happen. In that case, scalability is the ability to grow to whatever size your industry or the market that you serve will allow. Now, the analogy that I like to make is this, and, it, and I think it points out the difference between sort of, quotes mere growth in fun, which is what happened in fun. As we already said, we can't scale. You can only scale in predictable success. The difference is this. If you think of your industry, or if you're in a not-for-profit, the market you serve, I want you to think of it as the tallest skyscraper in the world, 292 floors high or whatever the that big building in Dubai is. When you're in fun, growing is like running up the stairwell, right? We got ourselves, get our resources, make sure everybody's with us, charge, burst through the doors, into the stairwell, up a few flights of stairs, 
until you're exhausted. I would and you look back and say, boy, 2000 and whoa, it was a great year, wasn't it? Wow. Uh, and then you think, Shh, I'm exhausted. I would just, let's just sit here for a little bit. Somebody pats their pockets. I said, oh, geez, I left my glasses two floors down. I can't go back down a few floors. I'm stretching this a lot, but that's what growing is like. It's a very, very resource, resource consuming, exhausting activity. And it's not easily repeatable. Scaling is walking over to the elevator, pressing the button, walking in, pressing the button to the floor you want. And in a sense, and I'm really stretching this a little bit, it's nothing like as simple as this, but in a sense, it's just as easy to press the button for the 14th floor as it is for the 95th floor. After you have done one minor thing, which is build the elevator shaft and the elevator. And that's the trick. That's the problem. That's what's happening when you choose in whitewater to move out towards predictable success. You have to commit that your building did not come fitted, pre-fitted with an elevator shaft and an elevator. You've been building this thing from scratch. You put the foundations down. Remember years ago in early struggle, you, you put the foundations down. You built it manually because that's the only way to go, right? And I'm, I'm going to preempt a question. No, you cannot put the elevator shaft in at the start. It will kill you. You'll run out of money. You'll go bust. So you build story by story, and then you have this choice. And you say... Uh, if you knew all of the terminology, say, okay, I see what's going on here. I read that smart guy's books. We're in white water. And if I could, we can go back to being in fun, just go back there and accept that there'll always be a cap on our growth. We can maybe get a few percent every year, but we'll hit a cap eventually. Well, we've got to build this elevator shaft and the elevator. And, you know, guess what? I can't just stop trading. I can't just go into the shop this is like building the engines for the airplane while it's up in the air. That's the bit that when I work with senior executives, founders, that typically are founders at this point, that's what gets them is the need to stay ruthlessly focused and not and to resist the temptation. Because guess what happens? Visionaries, short and patient uh, and they come in some Monday morning and they just got to do it. They just got to do it. People are looking around and saying, uh oh, she's got that look in her eyes. She, I know where she's going. I know she's headed. She's 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 headed for the stairwell. All right, we're going up a few flights. And boom. All right, we're going to open an office in Chicago. Right? Let's start selling leather belts. What? What? It's just because they got to scratch the visionary itch, right? And so that's where it's really hard. That's where the hard work comes in, and that requires, you know, in in my estimation, and this is very very broad brush, but of all founders that hit white water. About a third of them just want to go back to fun. Of the two thirds uh, that, that want to go forward to predictable success, less than 20%, maybe 10 to 15% of them have got the plasticity to shift their behaviors and the synapses wow. consistently and personally enough to build the elevator and the elevator shaft. Wow, that's that's some uh, dismal numbers, but I I would I would dare guess is even as high as twenty percent because I know that I'm the I'm the visionary, I'm the founder, I'm the guy that, that you're talking about. As I'm smiling here, listening to you, and uh, working with you know we our company works with hundreds of business owners nationally, and um, I see people often in whitewater using that term, and they it's the mental capacity. Can they shift? And so friends, my guest today is Mr. Les McCown. We, he wrote predictable success. We've been talking about it. For those of you joining us on YouTube, you can see it right behind over his head. He wrote predictable success, a wall street journal bestseller, which congratulations on that. Also wrote the synergist do lead and do scale. And we'll have a link to each of those books in the, in the show notes. Les, man, I, I think I could talk to you all day. You and I are talking the same language, but we've got to pull this plane to the ground. So I've got to ask you, as a reader, you can see behind me, I love to read. I read typically a book a week, and I have since I was 16 years of age. I love to read. I often judge myself by going into Books A Million and Barnes & Noble and seeing if there's a book in the business section or the finance section I haven't read yet. And so from, a, from one re reader, anybody who's a writer has to be a reader, to another reader, is there a book that you've read recently that you would say, hey, Justin, you've got to pick this book up. It can help you. If there is, what would that be? I know there's not. And <laughs> I hit to, I, I hit to uh, answer the que question like that, but there's a, there's a wider answer. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a massive reader and I'm a bibliophile as well. I mean, that means I like the, the books, I like books as artifacts. So, you know, I've, 
I've got three, four Amazon delivers, deliveries a week. Uh, I read all the time, but I don't read business books. And that's for a whole bunch of reasons. One of them mm-hmm. is that I know myself well enough to know that I read something really, really good in a business book. I'll think I invented it by about a week later and I'll be convinced that I did. Um, and secondly, I, I, I also just too easy for me to get pulled off track. I work within my own model, so, but I read avidly outside everything. Um, I love uh, any sort of uh, good history. I love, I mean, I love good fiction. So I, I, I get I, the, the thing that I love more than anything else, Justin, is pattern recognition. I, what I adore is reading something that's nothing about business and saying something, seeing something and thinking, that's a, that explains why this happens with that group of people I'm working with. So at the moment, I'm uh, reading a book uh, about the Treaty of Vienna, which is the um, massive rambling Congress in Vienna uh, that uh, came at the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. And it's just an incredible, well-researched researched history of these groups of five world leaders plus hundreds of non-national leaders that came together for the first time really to negotiate a peace in a way that had never happened before. And it's just a fascinating read. And that's the type of thing that I read all the time. And so my encouragement would be not to, not to suggest a specific book, but to encourage our listeners, go grab something that's nothing to do with what you do and see if you can find something that echoes uh, with you uh, out of that. So, you know, if you, if you once thought you might be vaguely interested in bird watching, just, just go get a bird watching book. Yeah, see what happens. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So I, I love to read as you, as I mentioned, and um, whenever I go on vacation, there's no business books. Last time I had things from how to raise goats. Cause we live on a small hobby farm to you name it. My degree is actually horticulture, believe it or not. So I know how to grow. I like to grow things. And so I spend a lot of time reading that, but I often ask our guests, and this is my last question for you today, Les. Um, and then I want to hear a little bit of how, how uh, our listeners can maybe get informa- more information from you, um, how they can connect with you. But Um, if I had, if this was your last day on earth, obviously there's lots of wisdom. You've read countless books. You've had countless experiences and we have listeners that are business owners and some who are not business owners, lots of advisors, attorneys, CPAs, business advisors, listen to our show. And we're all looking for, Hey, what's wisdom in a day and age, whenever, um, seniors or people who are a little bit more advanced in age or knowledge or wisdom, we often, we often, uh, push them away. I like to try to bring our guests and say, hey, last day on earth, man, you have one piece of knowledge that you could share to your grandkids or to your children or to listeners. What would it be? And it's not necessarily business. It's just, hey, here's what's on my heart. Here's what's in my head today as I'm asking this, answering this question. What would that be, Les? It would be ask more questions. We seem to have turned into a terrible bunch of monologists, you know, um, I watch people together and they're either on their phones constantly, or if they are talking, they're talking about themselves. So I just say, ask more questions and remember that often the very best question you can ever ask is just that, just silence, just Mm. not feeling the need to respond or ante up or give your version or just acknowledging that you've heard what you've been told. Sage wisdom there, friends, from Mr. Les McCowan. So Les, if if our listeners want to learn more about you, obviously we're going to have a link to all the books that you've authored inside the show notes, friends. But Les, if someone wanted to reach out to your organization or learn more about what you do, and it's not only small business owners, we have some pretty big businesses that listen to us. How might they connect with you? Well, you know, we, we could spread them with all my uh, social media and, and other links and all that sort of stuff. But uh, what about this? Uh, just have everybody go uh, to predictablesuccess.com forward slash Justin. What about that? Sounds and, good. And uh, 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 I'll put a huge extract from Predictable Success up there. So that it's a whole of the first uh, chapter, which goes through the entire model. And uh, I put a couple of little links up there if folks want to look at some additional stuff. And also uh, uh, just a quick contact form for me and it comes literally right to me I, I anything that comes in off the website it comes to me personally and folks if you have any questions whatsoever on anything that i've talked about here more than happy to answer the questions that you have just pop them in there and you'll get a personal answer from me 
Wow, that's powerful, Les. Thank you so much. We'll put a link, friends, to that particular URL inside the show notes as well. You can also check it out on our blog, financiallysimple.com. Les, brother, it's been an honor having you here on the episode with us today. Thank you so much for joining us and impacting our Financially Simple listeners. Absolutely my pleasure. It's been a delight to be here, Justin. And thanks, everybody. Friends, I realize that life is hard. You know, think about moving from whitewater to predictable success. As Les said, it's not easy. Life is hard, but life is good. We are ultimately blessed. And life can be hard sometimes. It can be frustrating, but it doesn't have to be. Let's continue to make our lives at least financially simple. Hey, y'all go out and make it a great week.